when a brother came to me and he said, you know what, Pastor? This is good, but this is hard. It's hard walking by faith. It's hard believing that God is in every storm. It's hard going to folk who've done you wrong when you'd rather they come to you and say, I'm sorry. And I said to him, brother, that's exactly right. Christianity was never meant to be easy. That's shocking because we live in a world that values comfort and convenience. And we want everything to be simple and easy. But the reality is that when you gave your life to Christ, you signed up for something that was never meant to be comfortable or easy. Won't you bow with me as we prepare for God to speak to our hearts and our lives today? Lord, when you spoke your word, the world came into being. When your word became incarnate, we saw your glory and our sins were forgiven. You decided to have your word written by men, inspired and led by the Holy Spirit, that we might know how to live a life that is acceptable unto you. And now, oh God, I ask that your spoken word, your incarnate word, your written word would all come together in your preached word. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. As some of you all know, for the past few weeks, we've been in the midst of sermonic study of a series called Courageous Christianity, realizing that in the dark days in which we live, when there's an evil in our land that is no longer hidden or afraid to come out of the closet, when it seems as every day we are faced with more news that is discouraging and depressing, that in days and times like this, what God desires and demands of us is to live our faith out loud. To be certain that our Christian walk is not something hidden or anonymous, that we wear proudly with the badge of honor, remembering that Jesus calls us the salt and light of the earth. And you all know that it takes just a little salt to change the flavor of anything. And a little bit of light can darken, I mean, can lighten any dark room. Reminder to us that a little bit of us living our faith can change the environments we're in. On our jobs, in our homes, and maybe even in our nation. That if there would be a people of God who step up to the commandment of Jesus Christ to live their life courageously as Christians, we can turn this nation around. And so we began this journey hanging out in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 15 and looked at how Jesus commends to us courageous conversations. The Lord says, when someone has done you wrong, don't sit back and get bitter about it. Don't sit back and tell other folk what they did. Don't post it. Don't tweet it. Don't even wait for them to apologize and come to you. You go to them, and between the two of you, you tell them what they did, Because wherever two or three gather together to resolve an issue, God is in the middle of it. And I argue with you that our relations in this world would be much better if people follow Jesus' advice, have courageous conversation. Last week, we looked at another area where Christ commends us to be courageous, and that is in our walk of faith. That when God calls you to walk by faith, you've got to not allow yourself to be limited by what others were not able to do. You've got to turn down the discouraging voices that try to talk you out of what God has called you into. You've got to shove your hand in every storm, believing that God must be in this thing somewhere. And that even if the storms keep raging and the situation does not change and the problem gets worse, if God is not speaking to the storm, God must be speaking to you and giving you the power to walk through what you thought you couldn't handle. Upon the completion of last Sunday's sermon, a brother came to me and he said, you know what, Pastor? This is good, but this is hard. It's hard walking by faith. 
It's hard believing that God is in every storm. It's hard going to folk who've done you wrong when you'd rather they come to you and say, I'm sorry. And I said to him, brother, that's exactly right. Christianity was never meant to be easy. That's shocking because we live in a world that values comfort and convenience. And we want everything to be simple and easy. But the reality is that when you gave your life to Christ, you signed up for something that was never meant to be comfortable or easy. Hear me, casual churchgoer. Christianity is not an extracurricular activity that you put on your resume of life. This is something we live and breathe. This is something that changes how we think and how we walk. This is what makes us strange in the world, that makes us peculiar. This is what gets you uninvited from happy hour. This is a lifestyle that ought to make some people uncomfortable. Christianity is not easy. And one of the most difficult things God commands of us to do is at the heart of today's sermon. I was in a pastor's conference, and the lady who was facilitating the workshop had an icebreaker that I had never thought of before. She gathered us all together, and here's what she said. If you could remove one verse out of the Bible, which one would it be? If you could edit out one verse, what verse would you take out? Somebody here saying, bring the tithe to the storehouse. That... <laughs> yeah. We get rid of that one, brethren, we'll be all right. I began thinking about that. And the one verse that I would take out of Scripture is the verse I've got to preach on today. It's found in Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to invite you to turn to the fifth chapter of Matthew. And when you found that, if you'll stand on your feet to begin our reading in verse number 43. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. And see if you can figure out which verse I would edit out of Scripture. In Matthew 5, verse 43, if you got a good Bible, it's written in red. This means Jesus is talking. Listen to what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. you no, know somebody tell them that one got to go. That, that one got to go. That. <laughs> Jesus says, do that, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you only love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you can only greet your brethren, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. I want to talk about courageous love. You may be seated. Those of you who've read through the Gospels in Matthew know that in chapter 5, Jesus is on the Mount of Beatitudes. And it is there, LeVar, that he begins what we now call the Sermon on the Mount. For those who will travel with us to Israel next year, we're going to go to the Mount of Beatitudes. We're going to read out loud the entire sermon 
from the place Jesus was thought to deliver it. And you all know how the Sermon on the Mount begins. It begins with the Beatitudes, that, that listing of blessed are the such and such, for they shall be such and such. After Jesus finishes the Beatitudes, he gets into the heart of his sermon as he begins to give an exposition and teaching on the laws of Israel. The key to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 is actually in verse 17 when Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill it. And after Jesus makes that statement, as you read through Matthew 5 this week in your devotional time, you'll see that Jesus engages in systematically examining six laws of Israel that he believes have been misinterpreted and he will show a greater fulfillment in his own life. Don't miss it. Six times Jesus lifts up a law that Israel lives by and suggests to the people of Israel, you've heard it wrong. This is what it really means. And the way you see it as you read through chapter 5 is this paralleling of two phrases Jesus uses. He uses the phrase repeatedly, you have heard it said, followed by, but I say unto you. In verse 21, 27, 31, 33, 38, 43, Jesus lifts up the phrase, you've heard it said. He then quotes a law that is rooted in scripture and then says, but I say unto you. Don't miss this. He says, the law says, there's a scripture, and then he says, but I say to you, trying to help them understand how they misinterpreted the scripture reading. So let me give you an example. In verse 21, he says, you've heard it say, he then mentions a law about murder. If you've got a good Bible, there's a footnote right there that tells you that is law that comes from Exodus chapter 20. And then Jesus says, but I say unto you. Okay, in verse 27, Jesus says, you've heard it said. He mentions a law about adultery. If you've got a good Bible, that Bible tells you that that law comes from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. In verse number 38, Jesus says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you've got a good Bible, that Bible tells you that's Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. Here's the pattern. You've heard it said, law, scripture, but I say unto you. Now, that's the pattern that is working when you get to verse 43. Jesus says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. If you got a good Bible, there's a footnote right there that tells you that comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. The problem is, when you go to Leviticus 19, 18, Stephanie, all it says is love your neighbor as yourself. Don't miss this. Jesus says, you've heard a law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But the law actually says love your neighbor. Hey, no, you ain't caught it yet. Jesus says, the law that you all are living by says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That comes from Leviticus 19, but Leviticus 19 only says love your neighbor as yourself. There's nowhere in Leviticus 19 that says hate your enemy. But Jesus, you said the law is to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. If the law only says love your neighbor as yourself, here's the question you ought to be asking. Where does the hate your enemy come from? You with me still? It's Bible study. The law says love your neighbor as yourself, but by the time Jesus addresses it, he said, listen, y'all are living by a law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but where did the hate your enemy come from? Can I tell you where it came from? Somebody added it. And they added it and said it so much that by the time Jesus shows up, it's a law in Israel that says, hey, you can love your neighbor and hate your enemy and be right with God. 
That hate your enemy is something that was added from human heart. Because if we can be honest for just a brief moment, hating your enemy is instinctive. Hating folk who've done you wrong is natural. Want to get ugly with people who've gotten ugly with you feels good. As a matter of fact, let me prove it to you. There's not a person in here who hasn't sat back and imagined all the ways you could get somebody told and get even with them and it made you smile every time you thought of a new way. No, that's why he's talking to you now. He's talking to you. And if we can be honest there, there are some people who are easy to hate. Kendall, some folk deserve to be hated. I know you're sanctified and you, know, you don't use the word hate. You just strongly dislike somebody. <laughs> you want to be sanctified about it. Um, people who openly lie to your face, they're easy to strongly dislike. People who betray you openly and stab you in the back, oh, I got you. People who say something to others, but they don't have the courage to say it to your face. Folk who wave Confederate flags. People who molest children. Those are easy to hate. And Jesus says, listen, if you hate your enemies, and you can only love people that love you, you're no better than a tax collector. Now, before you get a problem with folks that work for the IRS, let me make certain you understand. <laughs> tax collectors were Jews who worked for Rome to take money from other Jews. They were viewed as the lowest of society. You sold out to Rome and take advantage of your own people. And Jesus says, a tax collector can love people who love him. What reward is there in that? This is what Jesus says. You want to be a real Christian? You want the Lord to look at you and say, well done? You want to change the world in which you live? Don't just love folk who love you. No, here's what I say to you. Love your enemies. Can you imagine how that sounded to Jews? who knew Jesus was talking about Roman citizens, love your enemy. Jesus, I was with you on the no adultery thing. Um, I, I, I had your back with the don't murder. I even gave you a vote for the no eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But loving your enemies, you just went one step too far. Because if there's one verse I could take out the Bible, it'd be this one right here. Because it's not easy to love your enemies. It's not easy to bless them that curse you. It's not easy to do good to them that hate you. It's not easy to pray for them that persecute you. Yet Jesus says, if you really want to be identified as one of my disciples, if you really want to be a child of God, if you really want to be a vessel of the Holy Spirit, prove it by loving your enemies. And now you're here in sanctuary, you can't leave without being identified. Now you got to hear the whole sermon and be held accountable for loving your enemies. Here's what Jesus says, I want you to practice some courageous love by loving your enemies. So I had to do some understanding because this is the verse, Beverly, I want to take out. This is the verse I don't want to live by. This is the verse I don't want to obey. But since it's in there, I had to do some research to understand what do you mean by love your enemy? And the very first thing that the Lord pressed upon me is that you've got to know the difference between a neighbor and an enemy. If I can love a neighbor, 
but I convince myself I can hate an enemy, what is the difference between a neighbor and an enemy? And when you look at the original Greek in which the New Testament is written and the verbiage that Jesus uses, you'll find out something very unique about the difference between a neighbor and an enemy. Can I tell you what the difference between a neighbor and an enemy is? Your perception of them. It's not based upon what they do. It's based upon how you see them and how you label them. When you look at someone, do you see a neighbor or do you see an enemy? And courageous love begins when you make the decision to look at somebody and refuse to call them enemy. I mean, I like what you said. I sure enough don't like what you did. I wish you had never gone down that road. But when I look at you, I refuse to see someone that I label as my enemy because the minute I call you enemy, it's on and cracking. The minute I see you as enemy, I'm justified in fighting you. The minute I term you enemy, I've got to get back at you. But if I see you as something else, I can refuse to fight. What do you see when you see that coworker who gets on your nerves? If you label them as enemy, you've already set the stage to fight. So it begins with me saying, I refuse to call you enemy and I refuse to let others tell me you're my enemy. Beloved, please don't let others define who you are to fight. Okay, you, you don't get it. Let, let me help you. Um, I'm in second grade. And in second grade, I have an enemy in my class named Chuck Simpson. I didn't like Chuck Simpson then. <laughs> and if I see him today, we're going to have to have a come to Jesus meeting. Why, why in second grade did I not like Chuck Simpson? Because Chuck started calling me a name that stuck with me through fifth grade. Chuck called me Howard the Coward. Don't even think about it. <laughs> and, and, and I really didn't like him because that's one of them names that just sticks with you. Kind of like when people call you Pee Pee. You know, you just can't, you just can't outlive that name. And so I made it my calling in life to embarrass him as much as I could. I remember we were in class one day and the teacher asked a question and Chuck raised his hand and gave an answer. The teacher said that was incorrect, but I knew what the right answer was. So I jumped up, waved my hand. She didn't even call on me. I shouted out what the right answer was. She said, Howard, that's really good. Chuck, you need to go do your homework. <laughs> Amen. And when we were transitioning out of our desk, Chuck said something aloud to me. He said, we fighting at lunch. And I don't know if you remember this, but in elementary school, when someone says they fighting, it spreads from grade to grade <laughs> and class to class. And everybody knows Howard and Chuck gonna fight at lunchtime. I came down at recess Everybody's gathered at the playground. I don't know where the teachers were. <laughs> and Marcia, what they do, your friends will grab you and they'll come on, man, and they'll take you <laughs> and they'll push you in a space and then form a ring around you because you can't get out. If you try to get out, they push you back and holler, fight, fight. Fight, fight, fight. And so Chuck and I had to fight because others made us. Now, now I want to make sure you know the end of the story because someone's going to ask if I don't tell you. How did, how did it go down? I got suspended because he got stitches. <laughs> and I learned children are thrown into fights that they may not want to be in. 
But when you grow and you mature in your walk with the Lord, you reach a place where you determine, ain't nobody going to put me in a ring to fight with somebody that I don't determine is my enemy. You will not make me hate someone. You will not make me go after someone. You will not throw me in the ring. I'm too grown to fight because you want me to fight. Jesus says, listen, what do you see when you see them? Do you see an enemy or do you see something else? Here's the challenge. Don't see an enemy, see a neighbor. That word neighbor in Greek, it, it's a weird word because literally translated, it means near man. And it's not about residential closeness. It's about human proximity. To recognize that when I see you, I see someone who's near to me. Someone who's similar to me. Someone who's like me. And what will allow me to love you is when I recognize that although we may be dissimilar in a lot of ways, you and I are still very much alike. That when I see you, I see someone who's just like me. I see someone who sometimes speaks before they think, just like me. I see someone who says some things they may regret, just like me. I see someone who doesn't like being disrespected, just like me. I see someone who fights back at times, just like me. Like me, rather than me seeing an enemy, I see someone who's like me. And courageous love begins when you look beyond someone's action and validate their humanity. I see you just like me. And I won't fight you because I know you're guilty of the same things I do. So here's what Jesus says. He says, don't hate your enemy. It's actually a play on words in the original Greek language because the word enemy literally means hateful. So watch what Jesus says in the original. Don't hate the hateful. Don't hate those who are filled with hate. Don't reciprocate to them what they model to you. Here it is in Twitter form. Don't be someone's mirror. Don't let them look at you and see a reflection of their own bad behavior. Courageous love begins when I make a decision that I will not mirror your action to me. But I'm going to do something different. Jesus said, listen, listen, in case you don't know what it means to love your enemy, don't mirror them. Here's what I want you to do. And he lists out three things you ought to do to show that you love your enemies. He says... Do good to them that hate you. Do good to them that hate you. That phrase, do good, in the original biblical language, this is what it means. Leave no room for blame on your part with those who've done you wrong. Leave no room for blame in how you respond based on what someone did to you. Don't let someone's action to you leave you guilty as well. Because your response to them can be as unrighteous as their action to you. And what Jesus wants you to know is that when someone does you wrong, there are two things God is watching. What they did and how you respond. And your response can push you outside of the will of God even more than the offense they brought against you. I can't let your ugly mess up my walk with God. I can't let your immaturity mess up my walk with God. I can't let your issues mess up my walk with God. He says, D don't be one who can be blamed. Now, that's a word because so often we live our lives justifying and excusing our ugly because they were ugly first. He brought it on himself. If she hadn't done that, I wouldn't have done this. And the Lord is looking at you saying you're no better than a tax collector. A real Christian 
does not mirror to them what they brought to you. Do good to them who hate you. And watch what he says. And bless them who curse you. I don't. Because if I can raise my hand, Lord, this is where I need some help. Because I'm going to tell you right now, you curse me. As long as we ain't in the sanctuary. You might get cussed back. <laughs> Look, I'm saved, but I ain't delivered from everything. I'm letting you know right now. What don't say, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. I, I know how to put some words together that ain't in Scripture. It is not in my nature to bless someone who curses me. Amen. I'm telling you, you, you let it come, I'm coming back. And I'll just ask the Lord for forgiveness next week. Amen. Lee, I have a friend that told me, altar call ain't fun if you can't repent over something. Amen. I, <laughs> I got to have something to repent over. He says, listen, if someone curses you, bless them. Hope I had to figure out what that meant, so I looked it up. The word bless that Jesus uses is this Greek word eulageo. Eulageo, which literally means speak well of. Words well spoken. When someone curses you, speak well of them. <laughs> when someone does evil to you, speak well of them. When someone takes it in the gutter, speak well of them. Now, can I help you? Because this is a challenge. Sometimes speaking well means that you choose not to speak evil. Okay, so, so one form of eulageo is silence. That when you've taken it to that level, when you've cursed, when you've taken it and done something that should not be done, that I am in my Christian right to just engage in silence. Because let me give you this for free. People can't misquote silence. Because there's some people, no matter what you say, they're going to turn it around. They're going to spin it against you. They're going to find a way to lie with your own words. So I've learned in some circumstances, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I don't have to speak on every issue. And today I want to engage you to join a new ministry at Alfred Street that I'm starting. It's called the Ministry of Silence. <laughs> we'll be signing up volunteers in the narthex on your way out of church. But sometimes the courageous love is that which says, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. Eulageo, it's where we get the word eulogy. And you know what a eulogy is, right? A eulogy is when you're speaking over something that's about to be laid to rest. Eulogy is what you say when you're about to put something in the ground and bury it. Eulogy is the words that come out when you declare, I ain't looking at this no more, I'm not touching this no more, I'm not dealing with this anymore, that there comes a moment when Christian love demands not only that I not speak, but watch this, I'm not dealing with this anymore, I'm not going down that road anymore, I'm not opening that door anymore, we're not revisiting that issue anymore, I am moving on in my life and this thing is being put to rest. Let me help somebody with an easy amen. Christian love does not demand continual relationship. Christian love does not demand that we always sit at the table, that we got to go to lunch with each other, that we got to answer the phone. No, there comes a moment when for my well-being, I realize I got to eulogize this thing. I got to put it in the ground. I got to say ashes to ashes, dust to dust, 
The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Now may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. This thing is eulogized. Practice, do me a favor. No, somebody tells me, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. The Christian love realizes I reach a place where I'm not going to keep getting dragged back in to something I'm moving on from. He says, do good to them, bless them. And here's what Christian love looks like. Pray for them. Judy, I'm challenged. I wish Jesus would have said pray about them. <laughs> you do know there's a difference between praying about someone and praying for them. When you're praying for them, you're praying for the Lord to have his way. He says, pray for them that use you and persecute you. That term persecute, it, it, it connotates someone who's in relentless pursuit. Jesus says, because there's some folk, they keep coming after you. You trying to eulogize it, they won't let it go. They come after you day in and day out. Here's what Jesus says, pray for them. Because there comes a moment when you've got to stop engaging them and simply pray for them. So watch the difference between praying for and about. When I'm praying about you, I'm just telling God what's wrong with you. Lord, you know how wretched she is, God. Here's praying for someone. Lord, heal them of that issue. Here's praying for someone, Lord, bring so many blessings in their life that they forget about me. Ooh. You're turning them over to the hands of God. And Jesus said, when you do that, you will be perfect like God. And that's a troubling verse because the word perfect is a bad English translation. It doesn't mean be holy like God and perfect it like God and never mess up. No, the word perfect that you read there in the Bible means to be mature. It means to have grown to a place where you can pray for someone and recognize what God does. Watch the depth. God allows it to rain on the just and the unjust. Watch this. That God does not make a decision of how he handles someone based on what you want God to do to him. Let me make it real easy. Just because you don't like someone doesn't mean God doesn't. Yeah. Right? And so when we put someone in enemy category, when we pray about them, we pray, Lord, let the rain keep on falling. God, take, look, Lord, do what you got to do to break them down and make them realize. No, but the real love says this, I'm going to get down on my knees and my only prayer for you is that God will do whatever God was going to do. That when God wants to bless you, God bless them. When God wants the rain, God bring the rain. I am putting them in God's hands. And let me testify that when you put people in God's hands, when you sincerely pray for the Lord to have his way, God is able to make enemies your footstool. God is able to turn people's hearts around. God is able. Is there a witness in this house? Have you ever put somebody in the hands of God? And watch what God will do. When you pray for them, God takes over. God says, you let me handle the rain and the sunshine. You let me handle the discipline and the blessing. You let me handle the outcome of their life. Courageous Christian love says, God, it's yours. Somebody today, there's an assignment of homework when this sermon is over for you to go in tomorrow and not see an enemy. Walk in telling yourself, I do not have to fight you today. 
I don't have to hate you today. Because I know something. You, you're, you're just like me. And when I look at you, I see someone that God tells me to do good to. God tells me to bless, even if that means keeping my mouth closed. Good morning may be all you get from me today. And God is going to smile on me. Because I spoke. I didn't speak evil of you. And if I need to just walk away, I pray over this, and I put it in God's hands, and I let God handle the sunshine and the rain. Let's pray, church. Every day, God, the, the devil wants us to see a new enemy. Someone else we got to go at it with. Someone else who's done us wrong, and now we got to get even. And I pray today that when that happens tomorrow, God, it may even happen by the time we get to the car. Remind me to love my enemies. To see them as someone like me, not someone I need to fight. To recognize that I've got to live my life in a way where there's no blame on me because of what they did. That I'll speak well of you, even if that means saying nothing or determining that I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Yeah. God, that I pray for them. Right now, I want the Holy Spirit to put in the image of your mind someone you thought was an enemy, and I want you to pray for them. Pray for the Lord to have his way. Pray for God to bless them, to heal them, to rain on their field, to bring sunshine, for their harvest. God, I pray for him this morning. I pray for her this morning that I might walk in courageous Christian love. It's in your hands now, God. I will not put my mouth on this again. In Jesus' name, amen.